the question to me was how do we define a foundation document? How do we choose it? How do we know which are foundation? What purpose do they have? What meaning do they have? And where does that meaning come from? Well, foundation documents alone, and I could really sense it today when we were talking at that, um, in the classroom, foundation documents alone are lifeless. They're a tool of historians. They're worth no more than the paper they are printed on until the historian gives them meaning and people give them life. And that life becomes our heritage, our collective memory. Unlike, unlike history, heritage and memory is emotional, not intellectual. But both are necessary. And it is memory that fosters community and the identity and continuity of society. It is the means by which we tell ourselves who we are, where we are, where we came from, and what we belong to and it shapes an awareness that will help us proceed into the future. November 19, 1863, in nine sentences, he delivers to a crowd of 15,000 an address bringing the past, the present, and the future into a grand synthesis that to this day is securely embedded in the collective memory of every one of you. Lincoln describes it. The South was fighting against a tyrannical government that shredded the Constitution. The North was arguing the reverse. The question is, why are we all here? And then he looks into the future and explains, it is for the living to dedicate ourselves to the unfinished work begun by the honored dead. A wonderful synthesis of taking past, present, and future. And what do we do? We here highly resolve that they shan't, shall not have died today, that we will take a nation under God and give it a new birth of freedom. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Once again, global. It's always global in his mind. So here we are, a born-again nation that evangelical Christians in America at that time could embrace, uh, especially the abolitionists. But Lincoln was not a Christian. Remember that this was not immediately embraced, much like the Declaration of Independence, which didn't really take on much meaning until the 1830s. Um, this was condemned by many. Lincoln's words were pasted below the fully published two-hour and seven-minute oration of Edward Everett. Pages had that, and then those were just published below. The photographer never got his picture because he made a mistake. He was still adjusting his camera when Lincoln stopped speaking and sat down. The reaction, though, was partisan. The Chicago Times, the cheek of every American, must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat, and dishwatery utterances of the President of the United States. They also noted that he had substituted the word nation for union. And all through it, five times he mentions nation. He never used the word union in the Declaration of Independence. And the Times said that's a perversion of history so flagrant that the most extended charity cannot view it otherwise and willful. And the Harrisburg paper in Pennsylvania responded in words I'm sure it's correct. <coughs> we pass over the silly remarks of the president. We are willing that the veil of oblivion shall be dropped over them and that shall no more be repeated or thought of. And the London Times just simply said that the silly salad by the president was ludicrous. But Everett was impressed, and Everett did say that he thought that Lincoln in two minutes had come near the central idea of the occasion that he had in two hours. But there's lasting meaning to that address. It transformed a union into a nation. From this time on, the United States will never take the plural. Up until this time, it was always, the United States are a great nation. Now, he would talk about these United States. Lincoln said, these United States are. All through the Jacksonian, it was always are. Now it becomes the United States is. 
That's the difference between a union and a nation. 